Hey guys, what is up? It is Tate here, back with yet another video. This is a video I kind of teased in my Barbenheimer review. Uh, hopefully you watched that. If you didn't, I'll link it somewhere up here or definitely down below. But uh, today I just wanted to talk about, uh, I don't know, some of the films that have come out recently. We're kind of at the midpoint of the year. I mean, I'm a little bit past that, but I mean, some of the films in my uh, top 10 most anticipated uh, list have already come out and I've seen some of them and I just wanted to give my thoughts not only on those but also on some of the surprises uh, that this year in film has given us as well as some of the films that I was disappointed by which I think will be a lot of fun uh, I just kind of want to dive into some of these films other films just kind of like give basic updates on uh, timestamps are in the description make sure to follow me uh, on Letterboxd and wherever else I'm at and uh, yeah so let's just get into it number 10 on uh, my list was Shin Kamen Rider directed by uh, Hideki Anno the main reason I was excited for this film was obviously Hideki Anno has done the Evangelion franchise his entire life pretty much and seeing him do other stuff has just been kind of something I want to explore. I know he has a Godzilla film, I know he did some uh, Japanese live action films in I think the late 90s, early 2000s, I haven't checked those out but I just wanted something new from Hideki Anno especially after the magnificent uh, even Gillian, uh film that came out in 2021. Uh, I'm interested in this. There was only really like one day it was playing near me and it was like a 7 p.m. showing. I just wasn't feeling up to it that day so I didn't go but still hoping that I eventually do see this one. If it comes out on video or Blu-ray I'll definitely give it a watch. Number nine on my list was I Saw the TV Glow directed by Jane and I'm gonna uh, mess up their uh, the last name here. Uh, Sean Brune I think is maybe how you pronounce that. Probably not, but this director had a film called We're All Going to the World's Fair, which came out, I think, last year, and I really enjoyed that film because it had a lot of really interesting, like, creepypasta and analog horror elements to it, and it also kind of got into the psychology and the loneliness that people who engage with that kind of internet online stuff, uh, what they feel, and also some of the weird experiences they go through. And I just felt like it was a really great exploration of um, this kind of niche internet culture. And so I saw the TV Glow. I believe it's about uh, two children who had a favorite show growing up and then they start watching it. And I think the reality and the lines between reality and fiction kind of start to blur. Really interesting concept. Emma Stone is actually attached to produce this. and. A24 is also behind it, but we don't really know when it's going to come out. I'm hoping sometime this year. I believe there were test screenings for it. Either way, still definitely looking forward to this film. Number eight on my list. Uh, pretty standard, Killers of the Flower Moon, directed by Martin Scorsese. I'm still very excited for this film, maybe a bit more excited than I was, just because of the, the trailers we got. I mean, the second trailer was kind of a weird tone if you ask me, but still looks really really good um there's been a lot of buzz since it premiered at Cannes. uh it's gotten rave reviews sort of to be expected but glad to know martin scorsese has made yet another really great uh film and something that's even a bit more interesting about this is we have the runtime three hours and i think 26 minutes very long film and it's getting a theatrical release, which I'm very thankful for. Uh, I love long films when I get to see them in a theater, because in a setting like that, I think the time really flies by and I have less distractions, so long films really thrive in a theater for me. I'm very excited. This comes out in October later this year. I just want to see a really good um, DiCaprio performance if anything, but I'm sure everyone else, I think Lily Gladstone has gotten a lot of praise for her uh, for her performance, so I'm looking forward to it, uh, very much so. Number seven, okay, this is one I can finally talk a little bit about because I have actually seen this one, Bo is Afraid, directed by Ari Aster. Now, I really like Ari Aster. I love Hereditary, I love Midsummer. I think even more. I re-watched that earlier this year. I, I watched the director's cut for the first time and I had a really good time with it. I thought it was really, really good. And so, of course, I was looking forward to Ari Aster directing Joaquin Phoenix in a sort of bleak, surreal comedy role. And here's the thing, right? 
I think the first hour and a half is brilliant, especially that first part where we're kind of in the city that Joaquin Phoenix's character lives in Bo. Um, it's very surreal, it's very anxiety driven, it's just full of crime and really weird characters and I think it is so effective at sort of demonstrating what anxiety feels like. And then we have the next part afterwards where, you know, a mother and a father sort of take him in off the street and he gets introduced to their, their bratty teenage daughter. And I just think there was a really good sort of playoff there between Joaquin Phoenix and this, this other girl who just didn't like him at all. It was really entertaining. I just feel like after that, the film kind of slowly loses itself. I mean, there's really good sequences past that. I mean, we have the animated sequence, which is really fantastic. But otherwise, it just kind of felt like it was going nowhere. And the thing that bothers me the most, actually, is the ending. Reason being, if you've seen Hereditary and Midsummer, I mean, those films are known for their huge, iconic um, endings. They're very bright and vivid and they stay with you. For me, Bo is Afraid, the ending didn't really stay with me, and there's no spoilers here, by the way. I should have said that before, but no spoilers on exactly what happens. It's just not as imaginative and not as um, stellar as his previous uh, conclusions. So, I don't know. I thought Bo is Afraid was okay. You know, I, I lean more on the positive side because of the creative energy behind it. Um, unfortunately, it didn't do too well at the box office, but I still hope A24 or some other studio is going to give Ari money because I want to see him do more stuff and hopefully come back from this one a little bit. At number six, we have Oppenheimer. I'm not going to go too in depth here. Uh, I have my Barbenheimer review, like I mentioned earlier. If you want to hear my full thoughts on Oppenheimer, go watch that video uh, and skip to that part. There are timestamps there for that, uh, but I thought it was great. I think Christopher Nolan has really outdone himself, just to say the least. Uh, but at number five, we're going to be talking about Dune Part 2. It's looking more likely with each passing day that Dune Part 2 might get delayed because of the actors and writers' strike, which if that happens, completely understandable. It, it would suck, but I mean, I don't know. I just know that the trailer, uh, the, the new trailer is fantastic, but also I've seen that in IMAX two times when uh, it played before Mission Impossible and it also played before uh, Oppenheimer. And the Dune Part 2, oh my gosh, it looks incredible. Um, I completely have forgotten the second half of uh, Dune, the 1984 uh, movie that David Lynch directed, which not very good at all, but also that's not really David Lynch's thing. He's uh, he said a lot of things about that film where I really don't count that as a David Lynch project anyways. I totally forgot what happened, so I'm very <laughs> eager to come into Dune Part 2 with like no memory at all of how things go down, because I just know, looking at that trailer, this film still looks absolutely epic, and I think if we're going to get one more huge movie event of the year, it's going to be in Dune Part 2. I mean, nothing's going to match up to Barbenheimer, but seriously, I cannot wait to see Dune Part 2 in IMAX hopefully later this year. And then at number four, here's another one I can talk a little bit more in depth about. This is Asteroid City, directed by Wes Anderson. Uh, I love Wes Anderson. He was one of the first directors I kind of really delved into when I was getting into film back in around 2020 or so. And, um, you know, Asteroid City, of course I was looking forward to it, but I watched it and I kind of left slightly underwhelmed, slightly disappointed. Reason being, I really love The French Dispatch. I didn't expect Wes to make such a great anthology film, but he did, and there's so much stylistic variation in that film. And what's weird is that I feel like a lot of that and a lot of that evolution is really lost in Asteroid City. I mean, the color and the composition is all there, and it, it looks so nice because Wes really understands how to make a compelling image. But just a lot of the elements didn't come together in a way that I feel like was nearly as satisfying and as original as it was in the French Dispatch. And so my entire time there, I was just kind of thinking I really wanted more. There's still some great stuff in there. Like I said, color and composition. Also, uh, Jason Schwartzman, the father's uh, sort of character, uh, just about grief and uh, having to tell, having to deal with your children uh, after you know their their mom dies. I thought that was somewhat touching, and certainly Margot Robbie has a scene in here that is an absolute killer scene. But I don't know. I really just felt like uh, Wes could have done more um, to sort of elevate his style and, and bring it forward. It's a solid, you know, seven out of ten for me. But 
Um, really kind of wanted more on that one. And at number three, we have Across the Spider-Verse. I think in my original video, I mentioned I was a little bit nervous about this one, really just because Into the Spider-Verse was so incredible, one of the best animated films arguably of all time. And so following that up is a monumental task. But to my surprise, they really did it. And I, I honestly think still Across the Spider-Verse is better than Into the Spider-Verse. My reasonings really just come down to, I think the, um, a lot of the story details, instead of being more so an origin like Into the Spider-Verse was, there's a really interesting sort of family drama and sort of uh, ethical component uh, to Across the Spider-Verse that I find a bit more interesting. I also like the other characters a bit more. For example, Spider-Punk Daniel Kaluuya really adds a lot to that role and he's so great. Um, We've also got Spider-Man 2099, of course. I don't know, just certain characters like that, Spider-Man India, I feel like are more interesting than Spider-Man Noir or uh, any of those other characters from Into the Spider-Verse. I just feel like they were more livelier uh, in this one. I think the score is wonderful. Daniel Pemberton does a fantastic job with some of those character themes. Uh, obviously the soundtrack is great. Metro Boomin put some of his best work uh, into that. I mean, some of those songs are still on repeat for me today, so. Uh, Across the Spider-Verse is actually my favorite film of the year so far, and I don't really see anything else uh, surpassing it. So, yeah, um, they really outdid themselves. I'm really looking forward to Beyond the Spider-Verse. And at number two, it was Barbie. Um, I already gave my thoughts on Barbie in the Barbenheimer review. Please go watch that. I'm wearing a pink shirt because I just saw it a second time. Um, but definitely go check out the review if you want to know my full thoughts on Barbie. But so I have to say, Greta Gerwig has outdone herself um, yet again. And at number one is How Do You Live, uh, directed by Hayao Miyazaki. Now, we don't really have much information on this film because there has been no promotional material released for it. They just kind of released it in Japan on July 14th. Uh, we know a little bit about it. This isn't really spoilers, this is just some basic stuff. Apparently, the first half is sort of like a fantasy horror film. Uh, and apparently the second half, it kind of gets into more typical Miyazaki territory, which I think is an interesting combo. I'm especially interested in how that first half plays out because I've heard very good things, especially about that uh, first half. But I'm still looking forward to this one. This is absolutely my number one pick. Uh, I think G Kids has picked it up uh, for a North American release sometime later this year in theaters. And if so, I will absolutely be there. Uh, day one, day zero, whatever. The only thing I'm kind of mad about is that they changed the title for the North American audience uh, to The Boy and the Heron or something. Much worse, infinitely worse title. I have no idea why they did that, but uh, whatever. I'm still gonna call it How Do You Live? I think everyone else should do that as well. Okay, now that I'm finally done going over that top 10 list and what I was looking forward to, what was a good, what was bad, <laughs> what was great there, uh, we're just going to move on into this kind of phase where I go over three surprises and then three disappointments from this year. So starting with the surprises, I want to talk about Rye Lane. Rye Lane is a British romantic uh, comedy film that premiered uh, at Sundance and I, then I think Fox Searchlight picked it up and it's on Hulu now if you want to give it a watch, which I absolutely recommend you do. It's a very charming little rom-com. Um, does some interesting stuff visually. So like for example, it'll take the ultra wide lens. It'll use a lot of ultra wide shots, which I know a lot of people don't like ultra wide. Uh, you know, you can definitely notice the image isn't as uh, detailed with the ultra wide, but I personally thought uh, it looked really cool. It, add, it made it stand out from other films just the way that they used it and also there are some moments that you sort of spend time in each character's mind and how they're visualizing things and it adds kind of a surreal artistic you know just sort of layer to the film that not every rom-com uses and so the end result is a really charming and generally pretty funny and heartfelt uh, romantic comedy film and this is a, a debut uh, feature by the way from Rain Allen Miller. I was really surprised with uh, just how fleshed out and how really fun uh, this film was. It kind of reminded me a little bit uh, of the magic I felt watching the Before Trilogy which that right there that's a compliment uh, all on its own. 
So the second surprise I wanted to point out is uh, Past Lives, which uh, premiered at Sundance. It's a, a debut feature by Celine Song, and it is also uh, really, really good. It got a ton of just praise out of Sundance, and I completely understand why A24 picked this one up. I don't know if I mentioned that already, but um, what's interesting about Past Lives it's a very simple film on the surface. If you were to read out like a Wikipedia summary of this film, you would kind of think that's kind of predictable or, you know, that's like really basic. But what's interesting about Past Lives, not only is the filmmaking really intimate, it seems to have empathy for pretty much everyone involved in the situation. And this is a situation where pretty much anyone could have a opinionated stance on you know who's in the right who's in the wrong in this in this huge love triangle about a, about a woman reconnecting with a childhood friend this is a situation where you could easily point to some wrongs here but the filmmaking really isn't interested in, in painting anyone in a certain light it's it's really interested in being honest with how each person feels in the moment and i think that really shines in some certain scenes where we just kind of hear them speak about about how they're feeling and it's it's really magical in how it is able to capture uh, human emotion. And just from a technical standpoint, it looks absolutely gorgeous. So I highly recommend Past Lives. Hopefully sometime soon, it releases on video on demand because I think it's kind of rotated out of theaters now, but absolutely huge surprise. So another surprise for me, I didn't really know if I was gonna watch this uh, when you know I saw trailers and whatnot. Then I kind of thought to myself, I really like Tom Cruise in the action films I've seen him in, so I gave the Mission Impossible franchise a watch. That franchise is mostly good, it definitely has gotten stronger in its sort of later years. And I think Dead Reckoning is one of the best films in this franchise. It's certainly not Fallout by any means. I really like Ghost Protocol, but um, Dead Reckoning is really, really great just because it's so much fun. So for example, I mean, you'll have a car chase, which in these kinds of movies, there usually are car chases, but this one kind of has an interesting spin on it. So for example, we have Tom Cruise, right? And he's handcuffed uh, to a woman. And basically he's got to navigate this entire car chase sequences with that on him. But also he kind of has to treat her like a new recruit and sort of teach her, be her driving instructor, which it just makes for a really funny sequence. There's also an airport sequence where Tom Cruise is on the roof running and we see down here in the airport two guys looking for him and it just makes for a really uh, hilarious combo and I just thought a lot of aspects of it were really well executed so also it's not as big of a cliffhanger sort of deal as Spider-Verse was so that's to be appreciated. All right now we have to get into my biggest disappointments of the year. Um, these are films I didn't like. <laughs> I didn't like at all. Maybe I was looking forward to them, maybe I kind of wasn't, but you'll see what I mean. The first one I want to talk about, and this is honestly probably my least favorite film of the year so far, is Cocaine Bear. I was interested in this. I was definitely interested in this. I mean, the concept alone is kind of really funny, actually. You know, you have a bear that just got into a little bit too much cocaine and went on a rampage. That sounds funny, right? Except the film itself isn't funny at all. Also the characters, in a comedy film, I mean, you don't always need particularly deep characters, but these characters didn't have anything interesting about them. Not even like a, an archetype you could sort of latch onto and enjoy. They just, they were really boring and there was no like interesting human perspective uh, with these characters. Uh, you know, a lot of films like this where there's like a monster or whatever, like, I don't know, like a Godzilla film, for example, will have human characters and a human story, and usually it's nothing too crazy, but there's actually nothing here um, in regards to the human stuff. It feels like they didn't really try at all. So yeah, I unfortunately, Cocaine Bear was just not a good film. And talking about another disappointment, this one is gonna make some people mad, uh, most likely, but I didn't really like The Flash at all. Let me kind of set the stage here for how I'm going about this. In 2018 and 2019, superhero team-up movies were like the biggest thing in pop culture. I mean, you, you couldn't escape it. Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame, you know, criticisms you may have, those brought so many people together and those were huge event films. Reason being, a lot of the characters in there 
we had an attachment to. We had seen them sort of progress for 10 years now in this huge cinematic universe with multiple movies for multiple different characters, and it was the culmination of so much. And that's what The Flash is too, right? That's kind of what it was billed at, is the culmination of the DC Extended Universe, the end point before uh, the DCU sort of comes in and James Gunn takes over. So there was a lot riding on this film. Not only is it super expensive, but I mean, also, again, this is supposed to be the culmination of so many things. It was supposed to sort of round out a lot of Zack Snyder's characters, and it certainly does that, but it doesn't do it in a satisfying way. And just, I'm asking you to compare these two. I'm asking you to compare this to those Avengers movies because that's kind of what it deserves and wants to be compared with on so many levels, but it's just so much worse. Because think about it, The Flash is a character that people probably have the most attachment to in this film because he had a pretty big role in Zack Snyder's Justice League, not in the original Justice League. He really wasn't there much at all, but that's who we have the most attachment to. And then there's Michael Keaton's Batman, who some older people might have attachment to, but for this universe, people really don't know who that is. And then we have Supergirl, who I believe doesn't have a, a film or a relevant film at all. And so, you know, they're decent enough heroes, but there's just not lineage there for audiences to really grasp on. And that's why I really couldn't care less about any of these uh, heroes. On top of that, I mean, there's been visual effects complaints, which I think are perfectly valid. I will say some of the action VFX I actually think does kind of work being as cartoony and kind of stretchy as it is. But really the cameos are the worst thing about it. A lot of superhero movies have cameos, but I would argue some of them make good use of them. For example, No Way Home uh, really incorporated, I think, the past Spider-Man uh, really well in a way that sort of served to uh, give growth to Tom Holland's character. But that's really not the case here for the cameos we see here. They're just kind of there. And there's like a human heart at the center of the Flash, I'll admit that, but uh, the narrative isn't really concerned with that for most of the film, and just kind of the lack of depth there uh, really just made the film not work for me, so that's how I feel about the Flash. And then the last uh, disappointment I want to talk about is Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Now, um, I, I had seen Raiders the last time that I made uh, this kind of video. I saw Raiders, but after that, uh, I ended up watching Temple of Doom, pretty great prequel, at The Last Crusade, which is my favorite Indiana Jones film. The Last Crusade is absolutely amazing. Uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, definitely the worst one. It has its merits, but I don't like it. And then Dial of Destiny, I think, is not that much better. Reason being, I think James Mangold, just right here at least, is a very boring and, and safe filmmaker with the way that he shoots this movie. And because of that, it kind of loses a lot of the, I guess, Spielbergian magic that the other films had, even the fourth one in some ways. And then on top of that, Harrison Ford is so old now and he's still a little bit charming, but he doesn't have nearly the same amount of charisma or, you know, obviously, you know, physical capability that he did in the 80s. And because of that, a lot of the action just doesn't feel inventive. It feels very forgetful. And then on top of that, I mean, there's a moment here that kind of reminds me of The Last Crusade where You've got this historian, right, Indiana Jones, and he comes face to face with the history he studied his entire lifetime. But this moment feels so cheated because what happens afterwards is it just gets pulled away from us. And honestly, the ending of this film, I'm not going to directly spoil, but the ending of this film just kind of leaves us back where we were at the end of Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. And the only reason that there's any like trials and hardships is because of the situation that this film sets up for Indiana Jones on its own. It just generally introduces obstacles in Indiana's life that I don't feel were really necessary to tell and really don't end up getting Indiana anywhere else interesting, anywhere new. And so therefore, at the end of it all, it just ends up feeling really generic and unnecessary for a franchise that should have died a long time ago. Like a long time ago. Um, so that's how I feel about Indiana Jones and Dial of Destiny. I have a bonus one here. I wanted to talk about this because I think one of the honorable mentions I made in the previous video 
was about the Super Mario Brothers movie. It was something that I was kind of looking forward to. I thought it might be fun, and it was fun. You know, I don't think it's amazing or anything, but I actually thought the Super Mario Brothers movie was a good time. I appreciate the relatively short runtime. I think the animation looked good. And the best thing about it, the voice cast actually worked. It worked. I think it worked. Okay, listen. Chris Pratt might not be the best Mario, right? There's probably a million other choices that would have been better, but I think he does the job. More importantly, I think Jack Black absolutely serves as Bowser, no doubt about that. Those are my disappointments and surprises of this mid-year 2023. We'll see if any more movies come out. I mean, the strike has really uh, done a number for certain films, which I don't have a problem with. I would rather see the entire slate for the rest of the year get wiped away if it meant actors and writers get paid what they deserve. So we'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, it's been a fun year for movies so far. Some really great surprises, some really great stuff coming out. So uh, yeah, if you liked this video, please consider leaving a like, maybe subscribing, maybe giving a comment on how you feel about movies in this year, 2023. And uh, I'll see you guys next time.